There exist countless stories, books, and movies retelling the legends of a utopia, a city lost to time, to the depths of the sea. But did it ever exist? Today we're going to dive into the myths and theories behind the lost city of Atlantis. This is Red Web. Welcome back to Red Web. I'm Trevor Collins, and this is a very excited Alfredo Diaz finally <laughs> diving into the depths of Atlantis. I know you're excited you for it. You started spewing words, and I went, oh my God, is it <laughs> happening? And I went, hold on, this could be a debate. I'm not sure yet. <laughs> <laughs> could be a debate. Listen, we it's thought... Like the lost city of, like, Blantis. I'm like, what the hell is... It's like... The no, lost city of Blantis. It's a different one. Not Atlantis. <laughs> Everything's beige, and nothing tastes good. <laughs> Uh, well, you know, this is kind of the hangover week from our paranormal uh, oh, encounter that God. we had. You know, we figured Christian and I were like, listen, this is a little treat for you being <laughs> yes, so brave yes, yes. during <laughs> our... <laughs> hey, hey, thanks, guys. <laughs> <laughs> but seriously, man, like, I know that you conquered your fears when we did that ghost hunt for Halloween. Oh, and it's terrifying. Uh, and so, yeah, we wanted to explore. I've, I've been really excited to do this one, but I know you have as well. We've, we've hinted at it over the months. Yeah. There's been a lot of content creators out there that have inspired me to talk about it and I'll and I'll touch on those kind of more in the theories section but how the, this one's going to work a little bit differently than a traditional unsolved mystery so we're going to talk okay. about the history of Atlantis kind of where it came from uh why it exists as a story or mm -hmm. perhaps a historical fact right. um and then beyond that we're going to talk about the theories on where Atlantis could be if you uh, are inclined to believe some of the stories and then base those theories in fact right, right. based on how the stories have unfolded based on things that we know about some of these locations. It gets really interesting, and that's what really made me want to do this episode. I'm excited to dive in. But <laughs> that being, I mean, well, I mean, with that being said, uh -huh. I, I, I'm very interested to see like where this is located, mm -hmm. um, reasons why we're not able to go to these locations and explore. Um, now, when it comes to Atlantis, do I believe that there's a civilization underwater where people are living? No, but I feel like there could be a city that sunk down yeah. there. Uh, okay. That's where I'm leaning towards with what Atlantis is. Yeah. But I'm very interested to see just like anything, man. Just the deep, dark depths of water. It's like there's so many things, man. There's Dude. just... Absolutely. It's the next frontier. The, the, we haven't mapped that sea. We don't, we, we don't know. Own the sea. You know what I mean? Like... We don't go there and we go, this is, I mean, granted, we fish the hell out of it, but still, like, there's so much of the sea that we don't know of, that we haven't explored, that we can't explore, right. that's just left to its own devices, so. Yeah, well, I guess before we dive into it, because you've been so excited to talk about it, I know your theory is that this was a city, perhaps, that then sunk and is kind of lost to time. Yeah. Not like city... No, the, the Lost Empire, no. 2001's Disney, or whatever like, that was. I don't know. No, not at all. I but, don't feel like we're going to see Nimoy down there hanging out, <laughs> chilling. Dude, I, Aquaman. Just as an aside, what a fun movie that was. That that ignited my interest in Atlantis as like, oh, is this like a place where you can, like, they've got all this cool stuff, or did they have all this cool stuff in the past, all this technology? Maybe. But that'd be interesting. Beyond yeah. that, beyond your kind of initial thoughts, what is is the story of Atlantis that you are accustomed to, that you know about? I mean, it depends just what movie gets recalled into my mm -hmm. mind. You know what I mean? It's been twisted it, and turned a yeah, lot. It's, yeah, it's been manipulated so many different ways um, when it comes to like movies and TV shows, et cetera, books, everything, yeah, right? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, in some forms, it's a city that actually exists and runs um, on its own. And it's like own in little, present day. In present day, yeah. it's its own little air pocket. Some there's people that breathe underwater and that's where they exist, you know, mm -hmm. and others were which I believe more so is just a sunken city. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, people have found all sorts of artifacts because the world shifts a lot. I mean, you yeah. think way, way back, you got Pangea, the continental shifts, mm -hmm. tectonic plates, blah, 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 buzzwords. But eventually, like, you know, people have found ancient Grecian, like Greek things in the Mediterranean, like, and, and people have explored the idea that there used to be, like the Mediterranean used to be more of a river until there was this, cataclysmic flood at the Strait of Gibraltar that flooded it. So, like, there's a lot of... Okay, I'm kind of jumping the gun, but this is just my general thinking. They're, like, we have found a lot of artifacts under various seas and oceans and bodies of water that kind of really pique my interest to say, like, whether it's Atlantis or a general idea... Like, 
There are yeah. buried civilizations underwater all over the world, and it's just fascinating. Yep. But uh, I'd like to see if there's anything in there that, that doesn't relate to us, you know, mm -hmm. civilizations from the past or the current, you know, or yeah, just like sure. this. This is an artifact that this doesn't line up with anything in our time frame, our timeline. But yeah, we'll see. All right. Well, without further ado, let's dive into the lost city of Atlantis. The story was first told by Greek philosopher Plato in his dialogue Timaeus and as well as Critias. The story of Atlantis was first told around 360 BC. So like 2400 years ago was the first time this story really came about. And it was described at the time as a utopian civilization that was created by the demigods. Plato himself describes this city as a powerful and advanced kingdom that sank into the Atlantic Ocean one night around 9600 BC. So he's saying, listen, Overnight? I'm... Overnight? Yes. Overnight. Interesting. Uh, so he's saying, you know, when he's talking about this story, it's it has been 9300 years. So... We are closer to Plato in time, 2,400 years removed from him telling the story for the first time than he was yeah, to actually. the idea of Atlantis itself. When it actually happened, yeah. That's wild to think about because I guess I never really processed the depth, <sighs> pun not intended, <laughs> but of that timeline of, of how old right. this really is meant to go back. And, and it sunk overnight due to hurricanes and cataclysmic level earthquakes. So just... Damn. Must have like been an act of... Place. Yeah, what would be described at the time, even today, as an act of God, essentially. Just earthly destruction yeah. happening overnight. Did you say it was, an it was an advanced civilization, correct? It was a powerful and advanced kingdom, yeah, is how he described it. Um, and we'll kind of explore that a little bit, too, because some of the theories kind of dive into the technological power, the, the wealth, all of these things then being taken advantage of, which could also then have led back in on its demise whether morally right if we if we look right. at it through a religious angle or if it was more pragmatically through uh taking advantage of their own weaponry and, and all of these sort of mm -hmm. things there's a lot of actual analogies you can draw in comparisons to modern day uh right. worries and concerns about global powers and all of those sorts of yeah, things nuclear but, devices um, etc right uh, but Plato said that Atlantis existed around 9,000 years before he was born and that the story had been passed down for generations. However, the only sources of information about Atlantis available today are Plato's writings. So a lot of people find it hard to believe that this is more than just a story uh, because there is, like, if it's, if it's being word of mouth generation by generation, then why is it that Plato is the only oldest i should say source of origin for this yeah right, right? um it just seems so linear for something that should be so broad yeah if it was passed down it's like why was it passed down from just not just one generation it just seems like from one person to one person right. like to, or it seems like it was just created like yeah Plato, boom exactly had it. and to that point aristotle was one of plato's students he actually believed himself that plato had invented the island as a way to kind of teach philosophy, as, a, as essentially a metaphor with which a vessel to carry some, some messages and, and thought experiments forward, which I think is really, really fascinating and definitely plausible, yeah. right? Not to kill the idea of Atlantis outright, but yeah, like but I mean, looking at this it makes, factually. It like, makes the most sense. Yeah. Now, obviously, a lot of people like to look at stories from the past and see you know because we don't know a whole lot about history we only know what has bubbled up to the surface but that isn't nearly a majority of what there is to offer history has is filled with libraries being destroyed cultures being burned down and forgotten and so there's this natural want for humans to search for uh, similarities between stories and reality and so since the 19th century People have been trying to explain Plato's Atlantis by linking it to historical locations and events, you know, such as the Greek island of Santorini, uh, which was actually destroyed by a volcanic eruption around 1600 BC. So it doesn't necessarily fit this very wide time frame, but yeah. in relation to Plato and his lifespan, it was still quite before his time. And so maybe you know, he pulled from that. Maybe he pulled from that. Yeah. And maybe through the years, things could get misinterpreted or reinterpreted. Not maliciously or anything, but it just yeah. 
you know, you take a factual event and you are inspired to mm -hmm. plus it up a little bit. Man, the number of things in our history books, like if you actually took a time machine to go back to, oh to fully goodness. research and document, it's just like, I'm sure most of that would just be changed. Oh, yeah. <laughs> like, we, we look back on history. It's been filtered like, so much. Mm -hmm. It's been filtered and changed. And every even I hate to be cynical, but even history has a bias in it. Right. Someone yeah. who's writing the history books has a message they want to convey. Mm -hmm. They have an opinion they want to convey. And uh, and we look back as if we are these holier than thou beings looking back on history going like, ha, 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 you aren't advanced. But yeah. but really, I think we take for granted how forward we are, like technologically speaking, intelligently speaking, whatever. But there's going to be a civilization 100, 1,000, 10,000 years from now that look back on us and go, ha, peons, you know, yep. like we will be. And they just, just float into the sky. Right. They'll <laughs> teleport around and they'll use their time travel to go uh, clarify the history books. But but yeah, it's it's definitely it's definitely interesting. And that's why I love this kind of thing, because it really blurs the line between history, which is deeply fascinating. Mm -hmm. And uh, it blurs the line between nonfiction and fiction. Right. Right. It it's, really it's does. It's fascinating to me. Yeah. But going back to Plato in one of his characters, Critias, he describes Atlantis as being bigger than Libya and Asia Minor combined. Asia Minor, just to bring it into the modern realm, this is a historical way of referring to this area, but it's modern day Turkey. Oh, uh, okay. So I'm, I'm kind of quoting the character in, in using that kind of comparison. But just to give you an idea, that is, that is huge. Uh, mm -hmm. I encourage you to pull up a map and get yourself an idea of what Libya and Turkey look like because they are enormous countries. And I also think that there's something to that description because they are both on, Libya is on the south, a little bit to the east, side of the Mediterranean and then obviously Turkey being on the east and a little bit north side of the Mediterranean and so it makes me wonder if there isn't a reason why uh, this character or even Plato the author himself isolated those two land masses to compare uh, Atlantis right. to because it was in proximity or if it was just because Plato was familiar with those I'm not sure but it's something that kind of sparked interest in my mind there. Uh, the character continues to go on and, and describe Atlantis as being located in the Atlantic, just beyond the Pillars of Hercules, which would also be known as the Strait of Gibraltar between Africa and Europe, right there, just south of Spain. That's where the Atlantic Ocean meets the Mediterranean in that mm -hmm. very small bit of, uh, of water there. It's also worth noting, as we kind of speculate on the location of Atlantis, there is old Hebrew writing that speculates that Atlantis was actually at a point where longitude is equal to zero, which that is the up and down lines that we kind of, as we use coordinates on our globe, that those are the up and down coordinates. And zero longitude, I think, puts you a handful of miles, a handful of kilometers to the east of the Strait of Gibraltar. Okay. Kind of right down the UK, I believe, at least today. I don't know if it was any different um, During back time, then. Yeah. yeah. But to continue on with the story of Atlantis, it was said that Atlantis was protected by the god Poseidon, who made his son Atlas the king of this city, and thus the namesake of the island itself, as well as the ocean that surrounded it. Oh, Atlantis, Aquaman. Atlantica, Atlantica. You, I, you said Aquaman, and I, you threw me off. I was like, mm, Aquaman, I, Atlanta, uh, Aquaman. <laughs> but I, man, I have to say, I think. The Greek gods and like um, the ancient Greek mythology is just probably one of the things that got me into history because oh, it's yeah. just so cool. It's just such a it's clever, very fast way to explore the world and mm -hmm. things that at the time people maybe weren't uh, they didn't know the answers to a lot of things, yeah. and so they explored this. I don't know. I just love it as a yeah. story. Um, Zeus up in the heavens and Hades in the underworld mm -hmm. and the kid different characters in between like it was fantastic and just as an aside you know because Poseidon's in there too those three brothers I'm just thinking like there there was the time where they're okay these are the three realms heaven mm -hmm. the the seas and then the underworld and they have to decide between the the three of them who's going where and I don't know if it was like drawing straws or whatever but I just remember going oh Hades yeah that sucks man <laughs> but also I, listen it is what it is you yeah know? That's, you your abilities whole... are perfect for that yeah, I mean it kind of just works <laughs> I don't know if it's let's, chicken or the egg let's but... be honest you kind of belong there <laughs> oh man. But Poseidon, it's also worth noting, and, and this isn't in my notes, it's just me spitting, but um, Poseidon was, was of a great importance at the time because the Mediterranean was literally central to so many people's lives, Yeah. Uh, oh, es yeah. especially back then, because of commerce, because of travel, mm -hmm. the sea was everything. And so 
it makes a lot of sense that Poseidon would be in some way center to a, a great island civilization. But bringing us up a little bit into the modern history realm in uh, 1627, we have English philosopher and scientist Francis Bacon, not the inventor of bacon, as oh, I once thought when I first damn. heard his name. I want to shake the man's <laughs> hand. Thank no, you, sir. We all know that that was Kevin Bacon, but... <laughs> <laughs> Got him. Got him. <laughs> so Francis Bacon, in 1627, published a utopian novel titled The New Atlantis. And in this book, he describes a politically and scientifically advanced society in an unidentified ocean, kind of inspired by mm -hmm. Atlantis. Ignatius Donnelly was another writer, and in 1882 published Atlantis, The Antediluvian World, which is a major reason the story is still relevant today. Oh, okay. You know, if we're looking at why we're still kind of noodling on Plato's story of Atlantis, mm -hmm. it's not only that it captured the fascination of people over the, over the years, it's that many other writers have continued to dive into that oh, yeah. and expand upon it. Even like obviously up till this day, we have many movies and stories and books yep. and songs that are all inspired. I bet people started peppering in like, you know, the civilization and the creatures that they like tame and yeah. all these type for types of things and how they carry about their day, you know, living in the sea and being a part of the sea. Yeah. yeah it's just sure. a really clever take you know it it's is. just like it's a new world but it's like familiar enough because it's in relatively our own backyard yeah and also just because like we don't do much beneath the water you know what i mean so i think it's just so fascinating to it's think it's spooky that down there it's very scary it's very dark <laughs> that's that's something i'd like them to explore how how, how they lighten it up how are they seeing how are they dealing with the pressure? These are the questions I have. <laughs> <laughs> Let's get down to the real Hold questions. On. And are the owls involved, Christian? <laughs> no. Do you want okay. me to look it up? So many people, by the way, have tweeted me about my owls at the center of everything <laughs> theory. Like, going back in time, I find that owls find themselves related to most unsolved mysteries, and it's deeply unsettling. Uh, because owls what? are such beautiful creatures. <laughs> what? I, uh, listen, they're all over the place, man. I think they're... I think they're Letting think our guards got down, man. A number twenty-three situation here. I think so, yeah. <laughs> three examples. Uh, listen, you're gonna have to go back to that episode when I was crocked up and socked up. That's that's oh, where I was, I, was, I was spit. The dark ages. I was spit, <laughs> dark ages my, I was spitting mild fire about the owl, dude. Um, I was onto something. I'm gonna have to listen to that again and pick up where I was at because I, you know, listen, I don't, I, I don't know if I was picking up what I was putting down now, but. <laughs> Anyway, coming back to uh, Ignatius Donnelly, really cool name, by the way. Uh, his book is described as nonfiction, i.e. real, true, mm -hmm. factual, a nonfiction scientific investigation into the existence and history of Atlantis. So it's worth noting, though, when it comes to this novel, this nonfiction investigation, Donnelly did add some of his own air quotes facts to this novel, as well as some of his own ideas, one of those being quote, all great advances in civilization and technology can be traced back to the long lost island mentioned by Plato, end quote. He's referring obviously to Atlantis, and this is kind of his way of promoting the idea of diffusionism, the idea that all great cultures can be traced back to a single source. Every advancement in technology and in infrastructure, whatever, uh, can all be pointed back, all originate to aliens, to a single point, i.e., Aliens yep. and owls. Um, <laughs> uh, it, honestly, ancient alien theory, if you want to, you know. Yep, that is a thing. That is what they talk about. But uh, it is, I mean, just as an aside, you know, kind of diving into that a little bit, it is It is a bit of an oddity that you start seeing pyramidal structures showing up all around the world yeah. in very a, a very narrow time frame concurrently. And so that either tells you, okay, well, where was this inspired from? Was it something like Atlantis? Was it something like aliens? Or was it that, you know, we could traverse this planet better than we thought? And True. does that then play into diffusionism? Did someone start this? Was it ancient Egypt, for example? Yeah. Or Mesopotamia? Or the Aztecs and Incans? What, like, where did it start? Where did it disseminate from and to? It's true. It's it's an interesting theory, this diffusionism I mean, thought. Because like, what if it's just as simple as a, uh, you know, an exterior designer it just traveled and threw out these blueprints and went, this looks pretty good. And someone was like, yeah, that looks awesome. Build that here. I'm imagining a really, like, modern hipster-looking kind of person. Oh yeah, mustache 
round lenses, very thin. No, actually, no lenses, just round frames. <laughs> just the frame. <laughs> yeah. You know, uh, the real slicked back pomade hair mm-hmm. and, and plaid suspenders kicking it with the high waters, walking around going, you know what would really spice up your civilization? I made him British for some reason. <laughs> you know what would really spice up your civilization? Pops on a, uh, a pipe yeah. for some reason. This big triangle. <laughs> You're gonna love it. I see squares. Squares everywhere. Round is out the window. <laughs> Triangles <laughs> is the future. Let's get sharp with it. <laughs> and uh, maybe it was a defense mechanism for aliens to not land on the planet. You That's know, get true. A couple spikes. Uh, anyway. <laughs> Stay off of our Man planet. Was a hero. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and then he came back to 2021 and headed to the, the nearest Starbucks and said, I've, I've done my work. But coming back to Donnelly's book, he claimed that Atlantis' immigrants and had populated much of ancient Europe, Africa, and the Americas. And this is kind of how he's explaining this idea of diffusionism. And the heroes of Atlantis that emigrated out into the world were the ones that had inspired many uh, sources of mythology in Greek, Hindu, and Scandinavian histories, um, which could address some of the similarities when you look at a lot of religions and mythological stories Mm -hmm. of of the past, you can see a lot of similarities. And so I think this is Donnelly and his attempt to explain why there's so much overlap. Yeah, trying to tie it all together nicely. And and then also, obviously, um, originating it on Atlantis in particular. But... um, I, th- I think it's very fascinating. I don't know if it's Atlantis in particular that would be the the reason for that. I think it would be more of like the cradle of human origin and then the fact that we were all kind of on top of each other. Yeah, and then spread. And spread out. But um, um, yeah, to bring it back to Atlantis is imaginative. Now, obviously, coming up to today, though, we talk about Atlantis with these fantastic visions of advanced technology, uh, prosperous communities, uh, happy people whatever dolphin what, riding dolphin riding man i'm just talking like two-headed dolphins with 15 tails like zipping zopping racing them around like all right well that that's not real <laughs> well i'm sorry i didn't mean to go too far Atlantis, <laughs> serious <laughs> that that's not real <laughs> But like, but it's fantasized as an advanced utopian civilization holding wisdom and prosperity that could bring world peace, right? But it, it's worth noting and reflecting back on Plato's original story. That is not really how Plato described it. He described this uh, Atlantis in a much darker light. And I want to explore that now through the lens of Professor of Archaeology Ken Fetter in his book, Encyclopedia of Dubious Archaeology. He notes that in Plato's story, quote, Atlantis is not a place to be honored or emulated at all. Atlantis is not the perfect society, quite the contrary. Atlantis is the embodiment of a materially wealthy, technologically advanced, and militarily powerful nation that has become corrupted by its wealth, sophistication, and might. And therefore, there's kind of where I was drawing on the idea that, you know, even today, you can see how this would be an analogy for oh, yeah. uh, global powers at large. Mm-hmm. Now, obviously, there's many sides to many of those things, so I won't give any examples. But uh, but yeah, I mean, so this does kind of lend credence, in my opinion, to Aristotle's claims that Plato was simply creating, based on maybe a little bit of history, creating a, a location with which he could convey meaning and convey messages without needing to use real-world examples so as not to... Yeah. Put anyone out or offend any cultures or what have you. I think it's it's good to build up an example location mm-hmm. and use that to convey your philosophical means. Right. Yeah, I mean like if you if you want to take the route of Atlantis being like the superpower and they just reached far beyond their means and, you know, caused their own demise, then you know that that does make a lot of sense, and you do get a lot of that bleeding from like movies and TV shows, where in some form Atlantis is coming for you know the 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 land dwellers, you know, mm-hmm. we're like, taking it back. Yeah, we're going to take it back. Whether it be um, you know we're a superpower, we're going to take it back, or you know people on land have just been abusing the sea, so we're right. gonna, like you know we've been save. relegated to the yeah. sea because of your ancestors. Mm-hmm. This is our time to, to you know. The fight yeah. continues, kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. But it's just really, I don't know. I guess it's really weird because if you had like the ability to live on, I mean, 
I guess not so weird, right? If you have the ability to live underwater, you have the civilization, you're living and it's functioning, it's peacefully existing, which I would be hard to do, right? Mm -hmm. Like if you have a civilization with so many advancements and so many people that are able to to function in this underwater world, how are, how is it not major conflicts? You know, right? Um, but if you're able to exist in this in, in peace, why would you even mess with anything above the surface? Why would you want to be found? That's that's true if you if you are in this safe bubble, but uh, I think that that almost kind of begs the question of uh, why any conflict exists, right? At the end yeah. of the day, like what are the means behind the conflict? What are the desires? Like, is it you know kind of it, leaning into the story? Is it an ancient argument coming to the surface, right, for vengeance or revenge in some way, or is it a power grab, or is it a we are in dire straits where we are now and our resources have run dry, and thus we out of desperation of survival need to expand out or kind of looking at Plato's own thing like maybe they don't even exist anymore because of their own faults when they they built up their wealth and sophistication and technology but then that became their own demise because they were corrupted by all of those very same things yeah. and so maybe it was Plato's way of saying like listen I know we all chase this kind of thing but maybe it's worth understanding uh, the 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 downfalls that these things that we chase can have if we're not keeping our head on straight. And mm -hmm. so, um, yeah, it's, it's really interesting. Cause like I said, like as a kid growing up, you just, you just know about this fantastic world uh, right. that maybe did or didn't exist. Maybe a couple of Disney movies too. Yeah. Where you're just watching and it's like, Oh, this is, this is fun. And then you, mm -hmm. and then you have more modern stuff like today where, you know, it's just like, the whether it be Aquaman or Namor and it's just like, cool. It's more, uh, militarized, mm -hmm. right? Um, yeah. Going back to the, the thing you were saying, how we're going beyond our reach, it's terrifying to think that in a lab somewhere, they're probably creating the most dangerous chemicals or things, whether on purpose or not on purpose, right? right? They're like For trying the sake to of cure cancer, yeah. but they've created this other... I mean, this happened in the past. There's a whole bunch of things, um, whether it be uh, different types of materials that we've created that didn't exist before mm -hmm. or whether it be uh, antidotes or different poisons that we did not intend to make, but we've made them and they've been created mm -hmm. uh, by accident. Yeah. And so like it'd be so terrifying to think of the things and how have we not caused some sort of like huge plague or zombie apocalypse or like, like Trevor's eyes. Maybe we have. I don't, <laughs> I don't know. know I don't know. Maybe don't we know, have. Dude. Who knows? Right? <laughs> like like, a, at the end of the day, it's just one of those things where yeah. I mean, science may be the Jeff Goldblum thing, right? Coming back yeah. to Jurassic Park again is to say like it, it, should we ask the question as we advance science, like, should we do it? Not just can we do it? Right? Yeah. Maybe it's not dinosaurs on an island somewhere. Maybe it is something yeah. else. Maybe it's a product that is poisoning us slowly, right. right? You think of plastics in our lifetime have already changed. You think of Teflon is now like this problematic thing, right? There's a lot, whether it's mundane or like really nefarious. There's a lot of everything in between. That yeah. We and it's learn. also one of those things where like, yeah, there's a lot of government regulations in terms of like what you can experiment on and do and not do. But like, how do you stop just 10 really bold scientists from doing it? And you know, you say 10 really buff dudes <laughs> coming through the town. 10 really buff scientists, you know what I mean? Underground, <laughs> slaying and banging weights, and then, and then walking over to the, figure that out. And then how do you get strong? And then walking over to the beakers and starts putting chemicals and waters together. And, <laughs> you know, there's some buff. Dude, no, okay. He need, All right. I meant to put one drop in, but I'm so strong. I tipped it too far, and I put the whole bottle in. You Okay. Ah. All right. Start off as a joke, but you're telling me uh -huh. out of all the <laughs> slinging and people, banging weights, dude, <laughs> so people in the world, there's not at least one group of buff scientists out there? Dude, there is absolutely a group of buff scientists <laughs> out there. 100%. Shout out to don't, those. There is a scientist out there. You don't think they exist, Christian. I didn't out say of all the people in the yeah, world. But your, your face is telling your me otherwise. Your face is saying uh, otherwise. Your face is lying. You don't think there's a group? Saying, I don't, what are you on <laughs> you about? You don't think there's an exclusive group of buff scientists out there? Exclusive. Do you think they formed with the intention of being the buff scientist yes. group? Or did it was just yeah. coincidence? Yeah, I think that's They're the... Like, oh, I think so. That's the first like check off. I think that's kind of what connected them right yes. is is the macros that's what yeah. connected exactly. them and then from there they say, let me see your diet plan for the last <laughs> yeah and then from there the love of science is what really cemented everything mm -hmm. 
And they I'm say, let me see you, what man. kind of volume you can push on this squat rack right now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I'm telling you, know? you're slaying a bang of weights, and then they're walking over, <laughs> and they're measuring yeah. the chemicals. Like their muscles. Yeah, their muscles, <laughs> too. <laughs> that just makes me think, there is, factually, someone out there who is the buffest scientist in the world. Uh, yeah, no, 100%. Like, you, did you look that's at that, awesome that you look at that person <laughs> think about shout out to whoever that yeah. is you look at that person and it was like holy hell like this guy must be a physical trainer no he's like a scientist yeah, yeah like i'm a neurophysicist <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah i mean there's gotta be a buff version of everything right there's gotta be a buff doctor out there yeah it's just like yeah you know i save lives i also, <laughs> I also live away <laughs> I'm just right. There's got to be a buff version of everything. Just like a little pediatrician comes through and he's like, oh, like he's huge. <laughs> yeah. And then like he like pinches the the little like uh, kneecap thing that they tap. For oh, yeah. Reflexes. <laughs> he pinches it in his uh, index finger and thumb because it's so enormous. And then he gently taps the child's knees and he goes, your reflexes are amazing. <laughs> Everything's good. Everything's good. Everything checks out. <laughs> like, and then like, You're good, kid. <laughs> Like a Mr. Incredible sort of situation. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. But you just give packets of protein powder instead of a lot of That's what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah, cool. Don't so mix them with the other chemicals, all right? Take this this omega threes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But, like, to conclude the, the loose history that we've explored with Atlantis, uh, I want to end with kind of the, some of the physical de descriptors of this island because this will feed nicely into where we're going. Now, Atlantis is said to be made with concentric islands of which were separated by moats and linked together by a canal that stretched to the center. So again, we're thinking about a civilization that is focused on boat travel. And so when you think of it that way, uh, it's great for agriculture. It's great for commerce and, and moving around the island. It's very much, this is a terrible, I think, like not, a, not the best comparison I could make, but when you think of uh, Disney's original idea of a Disney world, where he wanted to have this uh, this amazing futuristic community that was very efficient and it was all concentric. It, it was kind of like that. It was it was this very forward thinking society as Plato describes it, and that's why it had this very particular layout. I think the cool thing is because whenever you think about Atlantis, you're always thinking about what it looks like underwater. Yeah, right? mm -hmm. and to kind of hear about what the layout could be above ground mm. is very interesting, and it makes a lot of sense, right? Like they would probably have advanced routes during that time, which would be boating for travel and trading. But yeah, I never thought about above land. What does Atlanta look like above the water? I'm right. Like, oh, just castles. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then it's stuck underground. <laughs> I don't know if, um, Christian, if we can pull up Plato, like I know it's in one of the theories, but Plato describes these concentric islands with, uh, at the time, the, I don't remember exactly what units he used for the size, but obviously we can convert that into kilometers for today. But um, while you look that up, another thing that's worth noting is that it was said that the islands of Atlantis contained a plethora of gold, silver, and other precious metals, hence uh, the source for a lot of their wealth. So again, on paper, it sounds like this very forward-thinking, very, very modern, efficient, and prosperous uh, set of islands, but per Plato. Maybe not so much. Maybe uh, maybe corrupted. I don't know. I mean, you gotta think there's... That's just the nature of the beast, right? Alright, so I found a little more info on Plato's description of Atlantis. Per the Wikipedia article, Plato said that the... We actually said the Egyptians described Atlantis as an island consisting mostly of mountains in the northern portions, and then along the shore, and encompassing a great plain in an oblong shape in the south... These are all the descriptors they're using. Yeah. Uh, they extended in one direction 3,000 stadia, which is about 555 kilometers. He got his hand on the Google Stadia. The Google Stadia. That's what you were saying. It failed <laughs> today and it failed then. Yeah, well. <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and then across the center island, it was about 2,000 stadia, which is about 370 kilometers, 230 miles. And then 50 stadia from the coast, nine kilometers, six miles, was a mountain that was low on all sides. Uh, it seems like the mountain broke apart, and then the Very central. Detailed. This, yeah, it's a mouthful. The central island itself was five stades in diameter, about just under a kilometer and about half a mile. Oh. That was a lot. What's interesting there is that Plato is describing 
what the Egyptians described Atlantis' size to be. So I don't know if he's like trying to ground this, you know, if Aristotle's right and he's made this up for yeah. a way to convey philosophy, is he trying to substantiate it and make it sound more real by saying, ah, the Egyptians told right. me this, or does this actually substantiate the story a little more in that like the Egyptians also down. knew about it. Yeah, and maybe that's why we don't know about it because maybe the story was with the Egyptians for a long time and then was lost to time. I mean, we're still discovering many buried cities, temples, locations, not just in Egypt, but in all sorts of places around the Mediterranean. So it's totally possible that maybe someday we will uncover some historical narrative uh, about Atlantis, or maybe not. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, it'd be really crazy if, if even if it was like, I don't know, a shield or a piece of leather or something like that. It's just had Atlantis written on it, right? Or they're being right. embroidered or chiseled in. Yeah. Or it's even just... like, hold on. Yeah. Or even just <laughs> like, like this, this, uh, this concentric island design. If we saw something like that on something that dated historically back mm -hmm. thousands of years, now that to me would be a game changer. Yeah, that would be insane. Yeah, but uh, I'm happy that we dove into the stadia thing, the, the, the dimensions that Plato and the Egyptians described Atlantis, because it does feed into one of the theories that I'm I'm really that really piqued my interest. But um, without further ado, I do think we should get into those theories on where this place is. Um, okay. And and why? Now, if you had to guess, I'm just curious where you just based on. Some of the stuff we discussed, some of the knowledge that you might have going into this, where you might think Atlantis would be if you had to place it. I mean, honestly, probably around the Mediterranean, mm -hmm. um, maybe around Greece or something like that too, as well. Mm -hmm. If I could, if, if those are the ones that speak out to me. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, but that's about it. I I'm tempted to say just like if I went based on literally all of the detailed things with you know the pillars of hercules and all of that and and the atlantic ocean and stuff i'm inclined to say that it was a landmass either man i want to say that it was somewhere to the west of the strait of gibraltar but i feel like it's just kind of out there yeah and so i'm almost you, inclined to like, say it's nestled down near africa you know like as an attached piece of land or no but but just off near, the coast because there are a, a plenty of like island yeah, chains sure. around there obviously not nearly as big as libya or turkey especially mm -hmm. not combined but uh just i feel like just somewhere just off the coast over in, you know just west of europe and africa is probably like where island? i put it yeah is where i would place it but i do like you know if if i were to ignore the size comparisons and, and all that I would be inclined to say within the mediterranean makes a whole lot of sense yeah uh just because you know they are now finding evidence, like I said earlier, of of people having lived where the Mediterranean used to, well, is now, where it yeah. used to be low and maybe it was like a below sea level sort of situation and the Strait of Gibraltar let loose and this flood came through and maybe was the origin of so many stories. But Man, there's got to be some kind of like dive tour where you can go down and see cool. like the like parts of a civilization that maybe once was. I Man, that's so cool. That I, I, sounds here's dope. the thing. It sounds dope, but also just for the sake of protecting history and, and not, you know, yeah, well, maybe. already coral reefs are in danger, right? I don't mm -hmm. need people flash photographing whatever they find under the water or be like, <laughs> I'm going to take up. this little piece of vase with me. Like, <laughs> yeah. uh, who knows? You know, like it's the heart of the ocean. I found it. <laughs> but I, uh, you know, uh, we have our outline and I'm kind of shuffling through it because I want to jump straight to the theory. Like I said, that kind of reignited right. my Resonate, interest. Resonated in with you a lot. Yeah, and, and, and give a shout out to some of the t content creators that have talked about this theory. Now, this theory circles around what is called the Rykat structure, a.k.a. the Eye of the Sahara. Uh, this theory uh, explains that the remnants of Atlantis are hiding in relatively plain sight, not under the ocean in modern day as it might have once been, but in fact, above land, and very visible from space, deep in the Sahara Desert, or Sahara. Interesting. Yeah. Did so, not see that one coming. Yeah, this it's very interesting. And again, I I want to admit that there's there's this is definitely an out there theory. It leans on a couple key facts that I think might be could be. I admit a little flimsy, but regardless, I found it deeply fascinating. Oh, very fascinating. Yeah. So there's a YouTube channel with host Jimmy. It's called Bright Insight, and Jimmy describes 
the strange formation known as the Rykat structure, and he believes that this is the true location of Atlantis. I also want to give a shout out to a TikTok user named Phantom Universe for this is the person that made me personally aware of this theory. Uh, and I think he's got a lot of really interesting TikToks around this kind of stuff. But his breakdown of Plato's descriptors in combination with the Rykat structure itself really piqued my interest. So Bright Insight says that the structure is exactly the size and shape that Plato said it was. Now, this is where I think the, the theory gets a little flimsy when you really start to check your work. Because as Christian said, right, there's there's a, a lot of descriptors out there that Plato said the Egyptians had created, right. describing the outermost dimension being hundreds of, of kilometers down towards the inner island being a handful of kilometers. And I don't know if, the, if, if this 25-mile Rycat structure really honestly lands perfectly with the description. I think it does if you kind of go into the video and trust the source, right? Uh, not knowing where they pulled this information. So that is where I think this is the most flimsy. But regardless, I want to kind of explore this a little more. Uh, so looking at the Rycat structure, it does seem to visibly emulate the uh, the concentric island kind of look as if you were to have pulled all the water out of it because it's now in the desert. Uh, maybe it was once washed away by a giant flood or a huge cataclysmic tsunami or again there's the idea of earthquakes and maybe at one point it was washed away and then had resurfaced, right? So wait, there's just this giant dome in the desert? Yeah. Uh, you, do you want to actually pull up a picture of this right cat structure, Christian? What? Yeah. <laughs> So as he's pulling that up, I'll continue to describe it physically. <laughs> yeah. So it does, however, match up with uh, with some of Plato's descriptions in that the mountains that he described to the north can be seen clearly on satellite imagery, as can evidence of ancient rivers, which Plato once again said flowed around the city. Again, matching with some of the anecdotal descriptions that Plato had offered. Holy hell. Right? So again... Like, it's very hard. Like, we know the exact dimensions of this structure because we can yeah. measure it from space now. Um, but when it comes to Plato's description, the Egyptian's description, that's where I think things get a little flimsy. And so I think there's definitely a lot of room for error there. Yeah. I do want, I, I would, I, I would like to trust some of these creators that they have their sources checked. We just couldn't find these sources to match it up exactly as they said, where Plato's description exactly matched right. these actual dimensions of this structure. And so that's where I want to be honest and just kind of leave room for error there. But I digress. So um, is this an actual dome? So this is an actual structure. It's not so much a dome as it is kind of, um, it, it's almost like a rippling, if you yeah, will. Yeah, it looks like will. a rippling, but yeah. it's like sand rippling. Like, yeah, is there an actual they're rocky. They're, they're they're not just like sand dunes or anything. They're mm -hmm. actually rocky structures. Yeah, and wow, and, and there's like a just out in the seems Sahara. Seems like a yeah out out in the Sahara, and it looks like just a very nice put together circle. Yeah, it's it's yeah. very what uniform. Um, and we can kind of like noodle on that here in a second. But uh, I really like the idea that we're leaning on the ancient rivers here that float around this this supposed structure. You can tell like even when you look at Mars, you can see that water once flowed in certain spots. I think that that really ignites the imagination here. And I think there's also, and again, it's very hard to find concrete evidence of some of these things, but uh, again, anecdotally, there's a lot of descriptions that Plato gives as to the location of Atlantis. And I think people can be cherry picking here, but when you look at some of that data, it very much lines up with the location of the Rykat structure, which again is, is very interesting. So. Uh, but again, I want to shout out Phantom Universe on TikTok, who who kind of broke it down as well. It was very interesting, piqued my interest. Now, he expands upon this theory by describing how remote and dangerous this location actually is and how difficult it is to get to. Thus, we haven't really had anybody go out there with a financed excavation to look for signs of civilization having lived there. Uh, it's also entirely possible that after centuries and centuries, uh, millennia, I should say, yeah that this stuff might have degraded, been buried deeply, might not be able to be found. And he also purports that if this place was flooded and washed away, uh, that a lot of the evidence would have gone with it. So it's going to be hard uh, per this particular creator to yeah. maybe diagnose if this is in fact the crazy that home we... of Atlantis, but, it's, but never... man, does it really sound interesting. Yeah, it's very fascinating. And it's crazy that we can't just go and explore and- right. You think it's like, it's right there. Let's make this make sense because this is weird. It is right there. But then... In the middle of the desert. Yeah. <laughs> yeah.
Hey, what's up, everybody? Trevor Collins bubbling up from the ancient lost city of maybe Ireland. I don't know. We haven't gotten to the theories section yet, but Ireland is on the table as being Atlantis. If, uh, if that didn't surprise you enough, it's going to get weird in the theories section. But yeah, I just wanted to talk to you a little bit. As always, you know me uh, about Red Web housekeeping notes. We've got that merch, store.roosterteeth.com. Get in there, search Red Web. Join the task force, represent out in the real world. And you know what? We got some merch coming for Black Friday and Cyber Monday, too. So uh, if you want to go ahead and mark your calendars, unless you're listening to this after, in which case, it's in the store, baby. Get yourself some. Um, yeah, I'm really excited. We have a jacket coming. It's It looks awesome. It's like a canvas jacket. Uh, we have some pins coming. We finally have a rough date for the cryptid pin set. Uh, really throwing the football down the calendar here, but it's going to be coming in January of next year. So if you're interested in collecting those pins, uh, get ready for that. They are on the way. I'm so excited for those. And depending on how they do, I want to do uh, maybe some other pin sets. Uh, if you like pins, we also have that, you know, Red Web Task Force badge. You can get that represent in a subtle way. But anyway, we have all the merch. You can support the show by doing that and getting that. Uh, you can also listen to this show 24 hours early, ad-free. That means you won't get this moment in the show with me. But hey, who doesn't love a show 24 hours early? You can support the show directly by going to roosterteeth.com, become a first member. That means you get to see it and hear it first. Uh, again, ad-free, you get the premium RSS feed, so you get to download it right to your device. It's a fantastic way to support our show again. Uh, but with that said, uh, let me talk about some of our fantastic sponsors. This episode of Red Web is sponsored by BetterHelp Online Therapy. Is there something interfering with your happiness or preventing you from achieving your goals? That's where therapy can really make a difference. BetterHelp will assess your needs and match you with your own licensed therapist. It's worth noting that this is not a crisis line or self-help. It's professional therapy done securely online. BetterHelp offers a broad range of expertise that might not be available locally, and their service is available worldwide. BetterHelp is customized online therapy that offers video, phone, and live chat sessions with your therapist. It's much more affordable than in-person therapy, and you can start communicating with your therapist in under 48 hours. Nice and quick. And you also don't even have to use your webcam if you don't want, if you have that anxiety of appearing socially. Uh, listen, you're also at home. You're probably not wearing pants anyway. So just get in there, turn your camera off, and speak to your therapist if you'd like to that way. Why invest in everything else that's going on in your life but not your mind? I think you should if this is right for you. This podcast is sponsored by BetterHelp and Task Force. You can get 10% off your first month at betterhelp.com slash redweb. That's B-E-T-T-E-R-H-E-L-P dot com slash redweb. This episode of Red Web is also sponsored by Burrow. Trust me, furniture shopping is never a pleasant experience, but Burrow has gotten rid of all the unpleasant parts of that experience, making finding the new couch much, much easier. They ditch the painful shopping experience in favor of an easy-to-use website that lets you create and customize your own furniture. Burrow has modern designs that make moving easy, all made with durable materials, so it's as smartly made as it is stylish. Ah, I love that. And no matter the order, Burrow offers free shipping, so you don't have to worry about the sneaky delivery charges. You get what you see when you click it and put it in your cart. And uh, and if you need help picking anything out, Burrow has some world-class customer support, and that team can help answer any questions that you might have. Thanks again to the team at Burrow for supporting the show. Task Force, you can get $75 off your first order at burrow.com slash redweb. Let them know we sent you. Save that $75 if you want a couch. Burrow.com, B-U-R-R-O-W dot com slash red web for $75 off. Burrow.com slash red web. And with that said, pun intended, let's dive right back into that mystery. But as always, when we approach some of these theories, we want to talk about the wrinkles. We've done a couple of those now so far, but many people when looking at this particular theory say that, well... This seems to look more like a meteor strike, like an ancient meteor strike that hit this location, hence the the round, the perfectly circular nature of it. And I think then that the dimensions of it are kind of cherry picking, because if you look around the world, there are signs of many impacts, historical or otherwise. And mm -hmm. if you find one that happens to be in, a, in the relative area, that happens to be of a relative size, maybe it yeah maybe you, yeah. maybe it's luck but also it it's very interesting that this particular crater would have concentric circles like that that's not a super common yeah, shape uh, for craters to have yeah i would still think it's still on. not something that's common right yeah. it's such a perfect circle it's very very weird very right. interesting so 
I, I don't hold a lot of confidence in that theory, but damn it, if I have to, I have to admit that it gets my juices flowing. My brain is pumping with blood thinking about yeah, it. Yeah, I mean, I, look, <laughs> it, it, it was definitely one of those things where it's like you could probably tear it apart and, into pieces. And But we also have to recognize the topic we're talking about. Yeah, we're also talking right? about one, it's Atlantis. Nothing's, uh, but, if, we, if we had answers, we'd have answers. But I mean, think about that, right? Like, what if it was the location wasn't underwater? You know what I mean? Like, th these are different sides of this tale that uh, I just never... Never even thought about, never came to mind. Yeah. And like the, the fact that it could just be washed up in plain sight. Fascinating. Yeah. Like maybe it sunk, but over the thousands of years it yeah. managed to re reemerge I mean, I or something. Thousands and thousands of years of just like this thing had been pushed around here and there. And like who knows if it actually went into the water or got washed towards land. Like, damn. Yeah. It's, I don't know. It's so cool. And that's why, I mean, at the end of the day, that's why we do this podcast because. Just because, like, exploring the possible, yeah. the theoretical solutions to the unknown is just... That's why I love mythology so much. Because that's essentially what it is. It's its storytelling, but it's combined with ancient peoples trying to answer questions that they didn't have the the tools to, to answer. Or, yeah. the you know, just the answers in general. Or if we're playing Hades, they're really hot gods, too. Ooh, they smoking. Yeah. Going back to just <laughs> <laughs> Go, going back to just the thought of like asteroids, if there was a giant asteroid that was projected mm -hmm. to hit Earth, yep. are we prepared for that? No. No, right? Like no. <laughs> no, right? No, but that would be like the world has to come together and figure that stuff out. Yes. Type of situation. You get the world's best drawers. Or, or some sort of Game of Thrones sort of situation where we squabble and squabble. And what would really happen is the yeah. White Walkers, a.k.a. the Meteor, win. Win, yeah. <laughs> like, yeah. 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 <laughs> we squabble over our earthly right? <laughs> realm. <laughs> and like, <laughs> um, but no, we are yeah, not prepared for something like that. Prepared. But that, that being said, uh, I'm, I'm sure people smarter than us are absolutely looking into options. Like, there are... And this is a total sidebar, but there are there are, there are talks of uh, sending out spaceships that can then attach to meteors that can like jettison it just enough to nudge it off of the path. There are talks of like gravitational pull, like sending out something that is massive, and so it has its own gravitational pull that would like pull it off of its uh, Whoa, trajectory. That's weird. There's all sorts of stuff. So I mean, the the steps are there. We've yeah. landed on meteors before and sent We're back photos. It's wild. Worked. Don't gotta get fancy with it. You know, pick the world's greatest drillers. Send exactly them what I'm thinking. Get Ben Affleck on the horn, you know Bruce I mean? Willis, and a handful of yep. miners. Boom. <laughs> we win, Gracie. I'm talking about the job. <laughs> 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 Don't want to miss You got to be playing that. You have, you have to play that while it's going down. <laughs> Oh, but man, let's go. Yeah, let's go back, back to the top. It. Let's go back to the top <laughs> of the theories. As always, man, I don't know. I, I'm just impressed, as always, with that gut check of yours. Maybe we need some sort of like gut check shirt or something to put you in because you're on top of the game. But uh, the the first theory that we were intended to explore was the fact that uh, some believe that Atlantis lies somewhere in the Mediterranean Sea, mm -hmm. which is kind of where your mind was at. So. This kind of theory uh, extrapolates once again on history, which is, again, a, a nice way to go about these theories. During the 17th or 16th century, it's hard to be exactly sure, uh, the Thera volcano eruption caused a large tsunami that some experts hypothesize devastated the Minoan civilization on the nearby island of Crete, further leading some of those experts to believe that this might have been the catastrophic event that inspired the story. Mm-hmm. Others believe that Plato may have confused Gibraltar as the location rather than the Gulf of Laconia, where the Pillars of Hercules surround, uh, which could explain the confusion of where the city may actually be located and why Plato claimed that it was located at Gibraltar in his dialogues. Right? He talked about it being just outside of, uh, of that location. I mean, yeah, that's not too far-fetched that, there, you know, maybe it wasn't this crazy civilization. What if it was just... Just a civilization. Just a civilization. Some folks. Just a decent chunk of a town, and then it got washed away. Yeah. And then 
people told tales of the you know the story and then obviously filtered over time became bigger than it became myth and legend and etc maybe this is the uh the origin location of those buff scientists and uh you know you wash Dude. away a country like that and uh, we look back with rose tinted lenses we think the only thing that oh that was the island that had those buff scientists See, they must have been an amazing civilization I don't, and then plato ex exists yeah. tells the story and here we are See, today i don't think that that would happen because during those times you'd have to punch that, the waves back well that right out of the <laughs> But then also, <laughs> also like, yeah, like, like, but also, why would Zeus punish other buff men? Oh, jealous, right. Maybe like, Poseidon was jealous, and so of his brother, and he's like, <laughs> what that, what that land? He Poseidon and is thrown underwater, just. <laughs> 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 Get him. <laughs> they knew too much. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, I think, you know, it, it makes a lot of sense, you know, especially, I mean, we had global civilizations at this time, but it's, it, it's hard to ignore the elephant in the room of history, which is that a lot of documented history happened around the Mediterranean, especially mm -hmm. around what we are focusing on here. Oh, yeah. And so if we are to kind of build on the idea that this was an extrapolation of history and historical events, it, it's very likely that it was just a real location that ha that was in the Mediterranean and um, right? and some sort of natural catastrophe happened. And maybe it wasn't even as dramatic as it as it's expanded on in the story. And maybe, yeah. you know, maybe it was uh, something maybe it that was people just survived from the story. slowly breaking off. Like, isn't yeah. California breaking off from the United it's States? It's certainly on like, the edge of two major tectonic plates. And so there's yeah. a lot of seismic activity I don't know if California itself or if it's like the coast. Yeah. It's because it lies on that fault, that ring of fire that goes around the Pacific. Mm -hmm. But um, I, what is it? The Atlantic is growing while the Pacific is shrinking. Is that what's happening? That sounds. I think that's right. how it's going. Because the plates are expanding. Because Yeah. Pacific. Yeah. Just by the way the yeah. plates are moving. So, yeah. I mean, like, I, I wouldn't say that this is a tectonic plate situation if outside of tectonic shifts causing cataclysmic events. Uh, because it takes it takes eons for oh, yeah. actual movements to be happening. I mean, I, we're talking centimeters uh, over tens of years, right? Yeah. Um, and and it, I mean that does sound like quite a bit, but it, it takes a while to stack up a to the point time, of a sure. uh, an island disappearing. Yeah, it's more so. I feel like it got washed away. Yeah, for sure. And I mean, like, and again, this is just me geeking out a little bit, and, and I don't pretend to know too much about this kind of history, but. I mean, the there the land gap between England and France has recently been explored to have been a valley that had uh, water dissoluble sediment. Hence, the you know you look at the chalky cliffs of Dover, those white cliffs of Dover, you know that that was part of what w held the water back. And at some point, water just kind of continuously eroded right. that, and then boosh, swamped the through. valley out. And now it's now it is a channel, right? The English Channel. And so many people are now starting to realize may, maybe that is what happened. And maybe that is what happened as well with the Mediterranean. Um, and that's why I love historical fiction and, and the exploration of history in general. Yeah. I mean, this will never ha happen in our lifetime. And obviously, it's really good to look into and understand our own planet. But, man, I really wish we kicked it back into, like, just outer space. Yeah. Exploring and building and figuring out. Cause I feel like, I mean, obviously, inevitably, way past our time. Granted, we'll probably destroy ourselves before then. The future is off of this planet. Probably. Yeah. Unless we can sort our stuff out. But speaking billions of years, we're definitely needing to get the heck out of here. Yeah. yeah that sun's coming for us. Yep. Um, but also just looking for resources and expanding our knowledge. and uh, mm -hmm. But also realizing we are in the vast emptiness of space. We are, we are on an speck. island. Yeah. That would be like living in Hawaii, but the rest of the world didn't exist. Doesn't that give you some sort of weird? <laughs> you what do you put it like? What do you have against Hawaii? Oh, I no, love Hawaii. It's just but, but being scary, so far yeah. removed from everything yeah. and nothing else exists. You're on this tiny. I would say island. maybe it's like having two Hawaii's on the opposite sides of the world, and one is not like known this about. There's like this galactic alliance that we're not uh, a part of. We're just missing out. I've on. seen enough Star Wars, Dune, and everything in between. <laughs> You pass. don't want to be a part of it. <laughs> Maybe it's good that we're not a part of it. <laughs> Never <you know>? mind. <laughs> Let us ants squabble amongst ourselves, you know. 
We're still fighting over Let's our ant bring hills. it back. Let's just send more cars to space. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Uh, okay. So, so as I kind of mentioned, a lot of these theories are going to be a little thinner than our normal theories because yeah, uh, it's, it's mean, a bit of a more fantastic yeah. topic. Um, I just feel like Atlantis is more of a fantasy than anything else. Yeah, I would kind of subscribe to yeah, that, but, but I do. It's, it's a really fun story and tale yeah. to kind of like dive into. Yeah, I do loving the exploring the idea that it could be true, mm-hmm. could be could be something a place that existed. Uh, that's what really gets gets me going here, gets my gears turning. Um, the next theory I want to talk about is that this location is uh, somewhere in the Atlantic Ocean. Obviously, that is a wide array of places. Um, a lot of Fictional stories like Marvel place Atlantis in the southern Atlantic Ocean, I believe. But uh, this is an obvious assumption just based on the name alone, right? It's called Atlantis. Yeah. (laughs) I was like, good job, Marvel. (laughs) (laughs) Um, But cores of sediment covering the ocean bottom surrounding the Azores Islands and other evidence demonstrate that it could have been an undersea plateau for millions of years, which makes these islands other possible locations for Atlantis to have existed. Uh, And it also kind of gives credence to the idea that, you know, maybe once what was once above the water is now below and vice versa. Um, It's just very interesting how this this is a living, moving, changing planet. And we have such a a short snapshot of it that we see it as this static entity, but it really does move and shift quite a bit. From the beginning of the island's settlement around the 15th century, again, referring to the Azores Islands, there have been about 30 volcanic eruptions as well as numerous powerful earthquakes. So again, this is a very active location. Uh, it's totally possible that an island uh, that is as active as this way back when uh, an earthquake happens and or a volcano yep. and half the island sloughs off into the sea and you create this cataclysmic tsunami, right? There's just a, a lot of different ways that we can leverage real evidence to to substantiate this otherwise uh, unknown story. Right. right. Man, what if it was just literally like three huts? They got washed into the water and then it became this big, huge tail. Like they're coming back home from a, a long day of work and oh. then they step up to their home and they see a wave just immediately take it out and they're yeah. like, <laughs> all right. Well, and then uh, they hold their friends and they're like, wow. Everything I ever knew was taken from me. <laughs> story. Tell the story. The and then story it just, of Atlantis. And it just evolved and evolved. Yeah. And evolved. An advanced civilization. <laughs> that was just three huts. Nah, dude. That was just your house, man. An advanced civilization. The most buff scientist this side of the Mississippi. Where's the Mississippi? You'll find it. Your kids are going to love it. Um <laughs> But th- this theory here is is kind of interesting. It is that Atlantis resides underneath uh, the Antarctic. Oh, that's cold as hell. Hold on, you're getting crazy now. Or I should say Antarctica. I kind of just dropped the A off. I guess, you know what? I, I borrowed the A earlier in this episode. <laughs> 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 but under Antarctica, which for all intents and purposes is, yes, frozen uh, winter tundra. And the peripheral of it is is ice. But at the end of the day, yeah, there is a rocky continent there. So I'm, I'm wondering if they mean like, oh, it's just frozen under the land, or if they mean that that land mass is actually perhaps Atlantis. Charles Hapgood uh, had a book in 1958 called Earth's Shifting Crust. He claimed that around 12,000 years ago, which does put this in line with the kind of timeline of Atlantis, uh, he said that the Earth's crust shifted, displacing the continent that became Antarctica from a location that was much farther north than it is today. I don't think this guy was specifically out to talk about Atlantis. Yeah, but, but people took it and went like, Atlantis! Exactly. Look! <laughs> the, they're like, listen, this guy's come up with a, with a pretty dramatic theory of a yeah. huge continental shift. Mm-hmm. Uh, and if he's saying that it was much further north, which honestly anywhere is further north than Antarctica. <laughs> right. Um, but if he's saying that it shifted from far north, you know, it, it could, uh, it puts it in line. Yeah. Now, the, the people that kind of believe this, that this was, in fact, Atlantis, now obviously being more north would be a little bit more temperate. In fact, much warmer if it was towards the equator. Um, now, this sudden shift, shoving it down south, would put it into a dramatically different climate, right? Very cold. Mm-hmm. Uh, the sun being on a whole lot of the time. Yeah, and then, uh, un- non-visible a whole lot of the time. Like, just a dramatic shift in, in day-to-day life. God, I really can't imagine living that I way. feel like they wouldn't have been able to make it through it. So yeah. they would either have 
died and died out and mm -hmm. then subsequently been buried by those layers of ice uh, or, or permafrost. Or they, they fled to tell their story of, of the ancient city or island of Atlantis. But that's kind of, that's the long and short of that one. I feel like if they fled, then we'd have some tales of people from Atlantis, right? It's always just mm, like... Maybe, yeah. The existence of Atlantis and some location and how it used to exist. But nothing of like... Oh, this person communicated with uh, an Atlantean, or this person right. saw an Atlantean. Like none of that. Like no one is no one t talk to these people. Like what's going on here? Like, yeah. Like, by, like what is going on? Yeah. Now my mind's wandering because you know, like there's a lot of exploration happening in Antarctica. My mind has wandered all episode. <laughs> uh, <laughs> so let's talk about these asteroids. Red Web. <laughs> My mind wanders. <laughs> Call um, up Bruce Willis. Please. <laughs> <laughs> but really briefly, I know we're looking at Antarctica for a lot of things. And there's subterraneous lakes and people are like, oh my God, there's ancient viruses and bacterium and all that sort of stuff under the ice. And now I'm thinking like, well, maybe it isn't so ancient. Maybe it's just that there was a civilization that obviously would be host to a plethora of bacteria. And then if they kind of got shoved down south and, and died out and got frozen over, maybe that is the the inklings of their existence, right? Yeah. I don't know. That's My mind wanders into that territory. And it's, it's definitely very uh, Ridley Scott to be thinking, like very Prometheus. Um, very much so. But um, I don't know. It's supposed to be an alien TV series, I believe. There is. Hmm. Yeah, see how that does. What well, Ridley Scott came out saying, "Hey, I don't. It's not going to be that great." It's like, great, hey, great, interesting. <laughs> Thanks for selling me on it. <laughs> uh, that's a strong pass, huh? Is he attached at all? Yeah, because he came on saying it's like it's not going to be that great. Is he the director or just like the like creative? Like I don't consulting know. Consulting. I'll look into it more. Producer. I just hmm. remember just the headline from IGN. It was just like that man. Hmm. He's definitely moved on. I think. Because he's got another film yeah. coming, in, and I'm like, "What yeah. are the aliens in this pirate movie or whatever?" <laughs> or whatever the, I don't remember what the movie was. Honestly, oh no, uh, uh, is it? Is it? He um, just did the last duel. The last duel. Yeah, that was really Scott. What's the one with? Uh, it's not Dolce, is it? Dolce and Gabbana. It's like there's another movie coming that's like talking about this vintage. Like, is it Gucci? Gucci. Is, is that, that really Ridley Scott? Scott? No. Yeah. That sounds... Yeah, yeah. I think that is it. No, that's not Scorsese. It, it looks like Scorsese. It does. What's it called? House of Gucci? House of yeah. Gucci, yeah. yeah. Ridley Scott? Yeah. House oh, of Gucci's Ridley Scott. So I was watching that Adam trailer. Adam Driver and Lady Gaga, right? It, oh, there's a lot of folks in there. Oh, and I'm yeah, like, a ton of folks. I'm like, I'm going to see this movie. Where are those aliens at? <laughs> 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 it's Adam Driver. Um, <laughs> sorry, Adam. Um, uh, big fan, actually. Uh, Ireland. <laughs> That's true. Hey, uh, thanks for listening, Adam. <laughs> I know you listen. I know you listen. Um, someone's going to tweet him. He's going to see it. And just, I'm, I'm like, I stand you. Uh, let's move on. I don't know if any of that's making it into the episode. The, the next theory is it just it, like, listen, I'll, I'll be honest. I'm going into some of these theories blind. Um, just uh, preparing for the day. So this one just says Ireland. And so my mind's like, what? Is Ireland Atlantis? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Don't, without reading the next Let's, line. All right. And moving on. It was. <laughs> Atlantis is Ireland. <laughs> so that would make me like a lot Atlantean. I, my oh. my heritage is, is like, a, I don't know what percentage, but a very hefty percentage Irish. Oh, so, yeah, I can breathe underwater. That's why we've never heard from them. They've been living among us. Yeah. yeah. Well, I didn't want to let you know just now. You guys weren't ready. You weren't ready. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my, oh, my God. He's poor Atlantean Irish. I sneeze and you see some gills. <laughs> Irishlandian. Um, in 2004, we have Swedish uh, physiographist Ulf Erlingsson, who proposed that the legend of Atlantis was actually based on a Stone Age Ireland. Now, he later stated that he doesn't actually believe that Atlantis ever existed, but he does maintain his theory, his hypothesis that the description of Atlantis matches that of Stone Age Ireland and Ireland's geography. And to his, to, to quote him, he said it has a 99.8% probability that Ireland is what they're referring to. What the? Everyone's over here like, no, 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 no. My place is Atlantis. <laughs> this is wild. Yeah, Ireland doesn't look as round and concentric. No, as, uh, not at all. As I think the but actual. But ninety nine percent. This man's. This man's excited about. Just throwing it. up some high percentages up there. Yeah, you know what I'm saying. And I mean, you know, 
I don't know what kind of the likes dog of he's got in that throw fight. Free percentages I've never seen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't know, uh, you know, what kind of dog he has in this fight uh, as a Swedish physiographist. But um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I'm, try, I'm just trying to put this all together. It's very interesting. So, uh, but so the Swedish man is saying, ninety nine percent. I'm like, just, is this a tourism it's play? It's hanging <laughs> around all over the place. This is crazy. Yeah. But uh, we have the director of the National Museum of Ireland who actually commented and said that, listen, there's no archaeological evidence supporting this claim. And um, <laughs> good to hear. <laughs> so I don't know. It, it, it's it's worth discussing, but that's one that I probably wouldn't. Uh, no, I wouldn't put any, put any wouldn't eggs in that basket. It. Yeah, I, I think it's just very interesting that just a lot of people. This is very quickly going to uh, a huge amount of the theories mm -hmm. in a way that I didn't see coming, which were mm -hmm. a lot of people are like, no, 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 this landmass that exists today is Atlantis. Yeah. Instead of people going like, I thought there'd be a lot more of like we've seen things underwater. Right. And there's these pictures of there's a, like right. uh, this uh, type of shield that we've never seen mm -hmm. in like books or writing. No, it's a lot of people just going, no, 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 my backyard. That's Atlantis. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. What? I, I, it's here. Like, yeah, no, I'm with you because like, again, I'm leaning on actual evidence that is continuously yeah. coming out, which is like, we found these underwater. marble pillars right. that are yeah. like, like ancient Grecian, like pillars under the sea, but they don't belong to like, this is a weird location for them to be in. And I found these that's marble what, tiles and I'll, that's what I thought this episode you know? was going to be. Yeah. Well, I mean, maybe some of the theories will be, but oh, oh damn. Yeah. But, um, you know, we like to cover all the corners. But, you know, this kind of reminds me of like doomsdayers, right? I mean, I feel like every other year someone's coming out saying the end of the world is this day, this year, this whatever. And and it just kind of reminds me that there are people out there that just kind of want to throw out a theory just so they can be the ones that called it. Like, so I was right. See, yeah. I called it. It is Ireland. Like, you, and you got to realize that t I'll take his his statistic, 99.8% probability that they're wrong. <laughs> yeah. um, 99 that they're just making it up. <laughs> like, how did you calculate that? Right. Let me see that formula. You know, like, what are you working on? And, it, and he goes, well, here it is. And he types in it on a calculator. And he goes, see? <laughs> Result. <laughs> See, he would have gotten better numbers if he was working with a buff scientist. <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> um, all right. So the next theory we're going to discuss is that it was swallowed by the Bermuda Triangle. Um, oh. Yeah. So in the 1970s, we have writer Charles Berlitz, who claimed Atlantis was a real continent located off of the Bahamas that had fallen victim to the infamous Bermuda Triangle. Supporters of this theory point to the discovery of what looks like man-made walls, streets, and everything else found off the coast of Bimini and the westernmost district of the Bahamas. That is what I'm referring to when people have found statues and yep, other structures and what, what they, about. they theorize are roads, ancient roads. Now that sh tickles my fancy. Yeah, that's like, what I'm saying. That's, I, that's some tangible shit. That's some good <laughs> stuff. Like, to inject that right into my veins because, like, that that's, like, when I see documentaries on history and I see that kind of stuff, that's what really piques my interest. Yeah. Now, do I think that this is Atlantis? I don't know. I, I, I don't know if I do, but I think when that first was discovered, that's immediately what a lot of people thought. And I don't know if it has to do with the Bermuda Triangle yeah. in particular because I think a lot of that can be uh, kind of just pushed to the side. But but regardless, this location, this discovery could very much fall in line with the idea of a civilization that fell to the sea. If you told me at the top of this episode that, you know, it's, was it the Bahamas? Mm -hmm. There's stuff there, et cetera. I'd be like, nah. But now I'm starting to think that Atlantis was just some small little town that got washed up. <laughs> <laughs> Again, three huts. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> like it just got washed up and became this big tail. So yeah. who knows? Maybe it could be there. Yeah. It is worth saying that since the, the discovery of this location, though, right. many scientists have come through and evaluated these structures. Because when that. you look at I them... I love that. Mm -hmm, I do, too. When you look at them, it is intriguing. It does seem like there's something there. But a lot of them have come forward and said, no, we've looked at these structures and we found them to be natural formations, natural beach rock formations. And albeit, we look for patterns that are familiar to us, but this is nothing but nature doing its thing in a way that is familiar to us. So... Oh. Not okay. necessarily saying that these were ancient streets, but, you know, there is still that little bit of wiggle room if you want to to say, like, maybe they were using beach rock as their stone to lay. Uh, you know, we used to use brick for roads, not yeah. even but 100 years ago, right? So, I mean, it's also worth mentioning the 
earliest recorded history of the Bahamas was 1492 when Columbus sailed over. The ocean blue? Yeah. Versus <laughs> <laughs> Compared to... You gotta finish the rhyme, Christian. <laughs> I'm My third grade I'll teacher would, you would flunk you for that. <laughs> Um, when that's, you know, the earliest mention of it, but mm-hmm. then if Plato is the one who's originating the tale of the city, how would he know if, you know, those two, right. there's been no connection between those two. I think that opens True. up another can of worms, which is literally the discussion of even the Vikings coming to North America prior to Europeans, right? I mean, uh, Europeans, I guess, technically includes Vikings, but you know what I mean. Um, I uh, There's a lot lost to history, and there's a lot that is heavily put through a filter of history and so it's it's totally possible that you know ancient greek folk knew about other civilizations and other empires across the world even across the atlantic and then that just got lost to time i don't know i mean we're still kind of exploring that everything gets chewed up over time oh yeah i mean there's a even then there's a lot of things that um lots of like big huge discoveries that have been made um by different scientists and et cetera, and you think like, oh, that person invented that when you realize someone else invented it first, or maybe even a couple other people invented it first, but they were just first to like be public with it, right? Mm -hmm. First to have the patent or be big with it. And you're just like, oh, they invented it. It's like, no, other people did. It's just this person came forward first. That's true. What's that? Is it a Winston Churchill quote? This is history is written by the victors. Yeah. Yeah. Like you guys were saying, that's a good point. I mean, even if you look at like, there's a lot of historical, uh, like kingdoms or whatever other synonym you want to use that have intentionally wiped out histories of those that they had conquered. And so it's, it's really rough to hear about all that sort of stuff, but at the end of the day, you can't undo that. But, um, I know we're getting a little long here, so I want to talk about some of the other theories that we have that, uh, seem like, you know, they might have some legs. We got the idea that Atlantis is actually a myth, right? But based on real events such as the Black Sea flood, So the Black Sea was a freshwater lake that was half its current size until there was a catastrophic inflow of Mediterranean seawater into the Black Sea, which was, again, freshwater at the time, and uh, which then expanded the size of the Black Sea. And this happened somewhere around 7,600 years ago. And so if there are people and, and cultures and civilizations on the periphery of this freshwater lake... And then suddenly all this salty water comes right. colliding through from the Mediterranean uh, and, and expands the the border to this sea. Uh, yeah, there's going to be a lot lost. Yeah, like lots of it gets washed up. Yeah. So to be specific, the influx of water flooded the Bosporus or the Strait of Istanbul, and it covered over 39,000 square miles of land. So ain't a small flood. Mm hmm. As the inhabitants of the region scattered, they spread tales of the flood, which may have led Plato mistaking these as events leading to the story of Atlantis. It also kind of makes me think of the flooding of, that led to Noah's Ark, right? And that tale. Yeah. And so, you know, a lot of stories of great floods have come out of history, and they could all be based on things like this. Right. I completely agree. I think it was just a smaller tale and then just got chalked up to be something bigger. Mm hmm. The next theory says that a lost continent found under Europe is actually the continent or the landmass of Atlantis. So to really go back for this one, it says that around 140 million years ago, Europe and Greater Adria began to collide and Greater Adria got pushed beneath and buried beneath what is now known as Italy, Greece, and the Baltics. Oh, that's cool. Even if like... You're not saying that that's Atlantis, just the fact that that happening mm-hmm. is very interesting. I didn't think about like cities just getting buried and pushed under. Yeah, or, or at least land masses, right? Yeah, right, land masses, yeah. yeah. And so like that's exactly what we're talking about with tectonic shifts, and that's where you yep. get huge mountain ranges like the Himalayas or the Alps, right? Because one gets shoved under, one gets shoved up. So do J.J. von Hinsbergen. Uh, a geologist at Utrecht University in the Netherlands notes that rocks from Greater Adria got scraped off and incorporated into the Alps while whole chunks got embedded in southern Italy and Croatia. He even claims that parts of Greater Adria that got shoved dozens of miles down into the Earth's mantle continue to influence modern Europe. So it's possible 
that despite this being incredibly ancient, right, 140 million years ago, it's possible that this could have been a landmass that might have been referred to as Atlantis, and Plato himself could have been potentially living on top of the evidence of the real Atlantis all along in Greece without even having known it. Wow. Yeah. Could you? Wow. So this takes away the idea, I think, Christian, right, that this was a civilization and more that it was a, a landmass and continent. Yeah. yeah. Which, regardless, is is relative fact, right? I mean, mm-hmm. there, that's yeah. the origin of the Alps. Um, now, whether that is, you know, what Plato is perhaps inadvertently referring to is to be determined, right? But interesting nonetheless. Now, the last theory we're going to talk about is is quite simple. It's the one that we've all, I think, been kind of slowly addressing or lightly addressing here and there. And, and that's that the city truly never really existed, that this could have been a fantastic right. story built off of historical or otherwise made up events, right? There's a lot of historians and scientists that concluded themselves, including Aristotle, his own student, disciple, whatever the proper uh, term would be at that time, that Plato, you know, made up the lost city of Atlantis for fictional purposes, philosophical purposes, metaphorical purposes. They say Plato invented Atlantis as a way to present his philosophical vision about an ideal civilization. And I think, you know, to expand upon that, even a great way to carry out a caution, a worry, yeah. a, a warning even uh, on the modern, on his take of modern civilization at that time, right? Because, I mean, you know, democracy is being invented. Uh, we got aqueducts flowing. We got Rome growing. We got, like, there's a lot of what would otherwise be quite modern tweaks and changes happening in his time. And I hope I'm not really scuffling up the, <laughs> the historical <laughs> timeline because I'm just thinking out loud. But there are no written records of Atlantis that exist outside of Plato's dialogues. And I think that is what I mean, really says huge. a lot. That's huge. You coming that's, in looking for those shields. Yeah, I, I'm I'm with you. That's what I want to see. That's what I want to hear about. I want to hear about ancient Egyptian stories. I want to hear it. See like a tablet of hieroglyphics that yeah. comes forward that gets translated to even slightly refer to something like this. If this is what Plato is leaning on is the, the Egyptians and their mm-hmm. tales of it. Uh, but there's not even any other text that survived from ancient Greece regarding this. So again, not a whole lot of evidence coming out of the yeah, ancient it's world. It's all on through like one person. Mm-hmm. I think that's like the big thing to me. Yeah. I mean, again, knowing of Atlantis just through what, you know, cinema has taught me, mm-hmm. um, which is why I've been wanting to dive into this episode, just because like, I'd like to know the more uh, air quotes, factual stuff. Yeah. But like to, what is all based on or whatever. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But to know it's like pretty much funneled through one person, it's very hard to believe. Kind of kind of dangles the whole thing by a thread, doesn't it? Yeah. Because like you're, you're telling me that like no one's ever talked to someone from Atlantis. I guess Atlantis never like no one, no one traveled outside of it. No one had anything that they could you would, show. If he's saying it's being passed down for generations, you would have to imagine that there are so many vectors yeah. of narratives being driven and um i don't know it's just all from one person it's like hey yeah and i mean to to kind of button this one up with something that i know you like is that tactile evidence that scientific right. exploration i mean we have dramatic advances in ocean exploration oceanography uh mm-hmm. the mapping of the ocean floor i mean even as far even as recent i should say as like planes going missing right uh, the, the Malaysia Airlines flight, right? And they're, they're mapping the ocean, exploring all outside of the west area of Australia just to see if we can find this small thing, this plane, right. let alone a giant a city. A giant city. Um, and there's still yet to be found a, a, a trace of a sunken city. And, I mean, I, I, another example, a better example perhaps, finding the Titanic and its two halves. Um, a giant win for scientific exploration and uh, and if we can find that needle in the in the large haystack you would imagine that maybe not finding artifacts and pieces of civilization but finding something like the rycat structure right you would imagine would have to be possible if this is if it was such a big land yeah. mass i honestly thought going into this we would find something like a big huge structure or different pieces mm-hmm. you know or that's just been you know along the coasts or in a certain part of the mediterranean and we just don't really have any explanations for and then from there the theories would be as to like why this exists as opposed to just what we have with this story which you know it seems like a story that was just fancied up and buttoned Mm -hmm. up real nicely and delivered to the masses yeah yeah 
I mean, I'm going to continue to keep dreaming. Uh, you may say I'm a dreamer, and I am. <laughs> that's <laughs> it's man dreams. <laughs> uh, but no, but like truly, I, I think these kind of pieces of mythology, whether based in reality or not, are deeply fascinating to me. And, and the exploration of them through the lens of history, in fact, is is yet further even more fascinating. And uh, I find the Rycat structure to be the most concrete piece of intrigue. I'm not sure I'm completely convinced by that. And I would love to see some funded research to kind of explore that if there's right. if there's deeper reason to do so. But regardless, I'm really happy that we, again, ignore the pun, but we dove into this topic because it's I'm, just another I'm frontier for, for Red Web, uh, another kind of topic for us to explore. I mean, it was a d way different direction. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm actually happy that it, it was a way different direction than I thought it would be. Mm -hmm. And it's very interesting to less interesting and not so much disappointed in knowing that there isn't things underwater that... You know what I mean? I'm there's just no, like, there's no loose threads. Yeah, maybe. there's like, no loose. We found this, but we don't know. Right, it's, exactly. It's, <laughs> and I thought that that's what this episode was going yeah. to be about, and maybe it wasn't. An update so it, it totally took you know a different turn in a way different direction. Yeah, and so it's just kind of fascinating to explore Atlantis as an episode, but mostly talk about where it's located above ground. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like that was just that threw me for a loop. But mm -hmm. yeah, it was it was interesting nonetheless. Now. Right, this was my little treat for uh, <laughs> you know for for um for doing that on location episode. Right, very uh, visual there's episode. A, that there's if there another if there's ever another treat to give Alfredo. I mean, if there's any <laughs> mysteries or theories with dinosaurs. Okay, Ooh, you know. okay, you know, some dinosaur stuff. Loch Ness kind of scratches that. Alfredo's, little Alfredo's little wish list. Yeah, <laughs> that's Alfredo's yeah, wish that's list. a wish list. You know. What I'm yeah. Yeah, well, that's uh, that has been Atlantis. I'm yeah, really cool. curious, Task Force, to hear your thoughts on the matter. You can always tweet us at Red Web Pod. We have our email as well, mm -hmm. redweb at roosterteeth.com. You can get the Rooster Teeth app. You can check us out on youtube.com slash redwebpod if you want to get some of those visuals delivered right to you as you listen. But uh, otherwise, yeah, we're really excited to kind of crack into this, uh, if you will, new frontier. And if you have yep. any thoughts or ideas or things that you want us to explore that are in this realm... Those are also ways that you can let us know. Comments and emails and tweets and all that. Mm -hmm. uh, we're, we're always open and we're always gathering lists and collecting your tweets uh, on, our, on our back end for Jillian and Christian to kind of look through. But yeah, let us know your thoughts. As always, you can review our podcast on Apple Podcasts. Uh, subscribe. Let your friends know. If you have a friend out there, just one friend that you think would love to explore the unknown with us, uh, word of mouth is the best way to support this podcast. Yeah outside of merch and all that other stuff that we usually talk about. but uh, You're on a trip, plane in the car. Ooh, oh, yeah. Yeah. Planes are starting to get a little bit more open now. Air travel's starting to open up. You know, you're getting out there, going on vacation, spooking yourself yeah. a little bit. A little car ride. <laughs> a little car ride. Nothing Go like a little bit it. of, you know, hair standing up on the mm. back of your neck while you're chilling on the beach. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but with that said, Fredo, I'll see you here next week. Yeah, that's Red right Web, baby. <laughs> don't want to close my eyes <laughs> and don't I don't want to fall asleep Cause, cause I you don't know what's you, in the baby. dark And I don't want to miss a thing 